Imagine yourself sailing across the ocean faced with monster waves and extreme weather, furiously crashing against your vessel, threatening to swallow everything in their path. Out here, hundreds, even thousands of sailors on these ships are at constant risk, not to mention the 60 to 90 parked aircraft on Navy carriers. That alone could amount to over $10 billion. This is the reality that all US Navy ships encounter out on the open seas, navigating through raging storms, battling against unpredictable hurricanes and deadly typhoons that can appear unannounced on the horizon. It goes without saying that life out in the vast ocean is always at risk. The actual sea conditions are significantly different out there from the steady and calm environment of the safe harbor in which some of us have experienced maneuvering vessels. So how do these ships handle big storms with monster waves? Let's find out on today's episode. Welcome to Mysterious Minds, where we release daily videos about fascinating stories and unsolved mysteries from around the world. That will leave you wanting more. We cover a wide range of topics, from paranormal events to historical enigmas. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe now and let's explore the mysteries of the world together. It came out of the storm, a sudden wall of water as tall as a 10-story building. On deck, explorer Jules Dumont d'Urville estimated the wave loomed at least 30 meters high, and it was bearing down on his ship, the Astrolabe, fast. Somehow, they made it back to shore, losing just one man on that dangerous crossing of the Indian Ocean in 1826. But when Dumont d'Urville, known as France's Captain Cook, and his crew later recounted the tale of the monster wave, no one believed them. As far as the scientists of the 19th century were concerned, what they'd seen was impossible. No wave could reach more than nine meters. For centuries, ships' disappearances at sea were blamed on pirates or misadventure, and stories of giant waves dismissed as readily as legends of sea monsters. Then, in 1995, a sensor on a Norwegian oil rig captured proof of what Dumont d'Urville had faced. A wave 26 meters tall, more than twice the size of any recorded in the area in the hours before, taller even than the hypothetical wave scientists then believed could only happen once every 10,000 years. That same year, when the ocean liner Queen Elizabeth II was struck by a 27-meter tall wave en route from the UK to New York, scientists had to admit something else. These so-called rogue waves aren't just possible, they happen relatively frequently. Facing down that 1995 wave, the QE2 captain said it looked as if they were headed for Britain's White Cliffs of Dover. So what are monster waves exactly, and are we getting any better at predicting and outlasting them? Today, the monster wave of sailors' nightmares has a formal scientific definition. A rogue wave, or what we call monster wave, is at least twice as high as recent waves around it. It can rise and disappear quickly out of a stormy sea, but it can come out of nowhere too, in calm waters. ANU theoretical physicist Professor Neil Akhmediev, who has been working to predict rogue waves through equations, says survivors will sometimes describe otherwise good sailing weather, clear skies before the monster wave appears. Such phenomena can even swallow rescue helicopters as they swing down to the water. In more than 40 years at sea, marine engineer Carsten Peterson says he never saw a more terrifying wave than the monster that crashed on deck during a voyage across the Pacific Ocean from Singapore to the US in 1977. From the bridge, he managed to photograph it snapping some of the world's few images of a monster wave. When the water crashed on deck, more than 22 meters above sea level, Peterson, now retired, recalls the heart-stopping moment they weren't sure if the ship was underwater or still afloat. Looking out of the bridge windows was like looking into a water tank, he says. No sky, no horizon, no ship in front of you, only water. But, like a miracle, the white mist cleared, and the tanker pressed on through the wild seas, although with heavy damage. Peter Van Doyne also spent many years sailing the world, captaining ships, weathering hurricanes and cyclones and skirting icebergs in the 1970s and 80s before monster waves were accepted science. I've seen some big, big waves, he says, but back then there was no proof and it is hard to judge the exact size on the bridge of a ship. When you got back on land, they'd just say you were dreaming. They found the sub split into three parts on the bottom of the sea, but it hadn't been attacked by anything or anyone. Monster waves are not tsunamis. Those waves are triggered by a large displacement of water due to an event such as an earthquake, volcanic eruption, or landslide. They affect the entire water column. At sea, you might not even notice a tsunami wave rolling under you, but near the shore, as it enters the shallows, those waves can climb to terrifying heights, often kilometers wide. Monster waves, meanwhile, are generally thought of as those at the surface. Although Professor Nayel Akhmediev says there are also giant, unexpected waves deep below, sometimes called monster internal waves. It's believed one such monster tore apart an Indonesian submarine and killed all 53 on board just in 2021 in the Bali Sea. 
That wave may have been up to 100 meters tall. There was no other explanation, says Akhmediev of the tragedy. They found the sub split into three parts on the bottom of the sea, but it hadn't been attacked by anything or anyone. The area is a known hotspot for such sea turbulence, scientists say, and satellite images taken at the time also revealed waves on the surface, likely ripples from a giant wall of water surging below. Aside from eagle-eyed sailors, Akhmediev says there are now many ways to detect rogue waves, from measuring pressure at the bottom of the ocean to special buoys drifting the seas gauging wave heights. If you counted out all the ocean waves one by one, it's estimated that one wave out of every 10,000 would be a rogue, he says. So there would be at least 10 of them at any one time in the ocean. Of course, luckily, there's not that many ships out there compared to the vast ocean, so not many will encounter them. In 2004, scientists using satellite data from the European Space Agency spotted at least 10 significant rogue waves, each 25 meters or higher, within just three weeks. At the time, the agency said rogue waves were likely to have sunk most of the 200 supertankers and container ships over 200 meters long that had gone down in severe weather over the previous two decades. Sometimes, in a phenomenon known as the Three Sisters, giant waves will strike in threes. In 2010, two people were killed when three such rogues hit the Louis Majesty cruise ship off the coast of Spain. The first didn't do much damage, but the second and third blew out the glass and flooded into multiple decks, Akhmediev says. Multiple rogue waves were also to blame for the 1998 Sydney to Hobart yacht race tragedy. In those wild waters, six lives and five boats were lost. Then, in 2012, Akhmediev and his colleagues proved the existence of another oddity, rogue holes, the inverse of a rogue wave where the depth of the trough, the wave's lowest point, can be twice as big as its crest, top. So they can be even steeper than the rogue wave and very dangerous too. This great hole opening suddenly in the sea, he says. We now understand what are the monster waves, but we need to know how exactly monster waves form. If weather forecasting is complicated, oceans are an even more complex beast, Akhmediev says. The wind whips up waves, driving them across the seas for thousands of kilometers. But everything from the geography of bays and ocean floor to the movements of the earth and moon, even the amount of salt in the swells can affect how these waves form. Still, there are two main schools of thought to explain rogue waves in physics. The simplest is known as linear theory. It argues that when two wave crests meet, they can merge into one wave twice as big, just as a trough meeting a crest can cancel it out and flatten the sea. Sometimes different columns of waves or wave trains will collide, often when different currents run into each other, forming huge waves for short periods. Think of cars traveling at speed. Every now and then, there's a pileup. At certain hotspots, scientists can see this in action. The most infamous is off the southeast coast of Africa, where the fast-moving Agulhas current collides with waters from the Indian and Southern Oceans. Tihirs can have an amplifying effect on the waves, making them steeper, like focusing light from a magnifying glass. When scientists at Oxford recreated that 1995 wave that hit the oil rig near Norway, known as the Draupner wave, in a tank in the lab, they saw something that looked remarkably similar to the great wave depicted by Japanese artist Katsushika Hokusai in his iconic 19th century print. Under their non-linear theory, waves not directly interacting can sometimes share energy. Like cars, they carry enormous amounts of energy, he says, and sometimes it can grow leaching out from other surrounding waves and concentrating into a single rogue. In 2012, he and German scientists tested their own solution in the lab, with one unfortunate Lego pirate whose ship they capsized by generating a freak wave in otherwise calm waters. The experiment revealed that rogue waves can be even bigger than previously thought, more than five times the size of others around them in a phenomenon they dubbed super monster waves. Now we understood what are monster waves and how they form, but how do you survive a rogue wave? Captains suddenly confronted with a rogue have few good choices, says Van Dijn, who is now a maritime expert. If a giant wave smashes on deck, it can conk out a ship's engines and other systems or wash away its crew and cargo. Even worse, he says, is a rogue wave hitting you at night. If you can't see it coming, you don't have any chance to steer the ship. Ideally, he says, you'd want to sail head on into such a wave. Being hit from the side risks a capsizing. Of course, going bow first up that steep cliff of water comes with its own dangers. If the wave is big enough, the drag could tear the ship apart. That's why ships wrecked in such disasters are often found in pieces, even with holes punched through their hulls by the water. Sometimes when ships disappear, they're found completely broken in two. It doesn't happen as often now, luckily, as we build ships better. Even some of the wild waves I've been up against, I've never really thought we were about to sink. 
When Van Duyn was sailing in the 1980s, at least one ship vanished every day at sea. Today, the global fleet is far larger, but losses have been more than halved as ship design improves. But experts, including Akhmediev, warn that ships are still not built to withstand the force of rogue waves, many, many metric tons more than standard waves. Many ships are built to weather waves only about 11 meters high, yet a review found every ship was likely to encounter at least one 20 meter wave over a 25 year lifetime. You can design ships better, but obviously that's going to cost. And you can't design for everything. They thought they'd made the Titanic unsinkable with all those extra compartments and bulkheads, but she still went down. Or maybe you'll end up making it too strong or too heavy. Steel on a ship needs to be flexible, not just strong, to move with the sea. Standing on the bridge, you can often see it flexing at the bow. It would snap otherwise, he says. Ships are designed to roll to a certain extent too in storms, but once they are bent over at 40, 50 degrees, they start to take on water. I've lost steering before on a ship and we couldn't keep it head on to the wave. Things got precarious, but we managed to right it. Aging ships, as well as improperly loaded cargo holds or inferior steel, can lower the odds of outlasting such a wave, he says. So can decisions made at sea. Ships often opt to slow down and ride out bad weather, but when they are on tight logistical deadlines, ferrying the world's supply chain, time is money. When the Suez Canal was blocked by one optimistic and 400 meter long container ship for six days in 2021, for example, ships instead braved the turbulent waters around Southern Africa to make their deadlines. They had to go into the rogue wave territory we usually avoid. Now let's have a look at the critical elements that keep the US Navy ships straight afloat, essentially preventing them from capsizing. As per the basic rule of science, objects float when they have a lower average density than water. Similarly, ships also float because they have a lower density than water. As a result, the downward force of gravity is less than the upward force exerted by the water. Another point worth noting is that the lower the center of gravity is, the less likely an object will tip over. Therefore, a low center of gravity is maintained by all US Navy ships by keeping the heavy machine equipment and fuel on the lower levels of the ship. As a matter of fact, the placement of all the equipment and installation of new machinery is carefully calculated by engineers on board, keeping in mind the stability of the ship. The next major players are the structure and design of the ship's hull. The large U-shape of the hull is designed to give it stability, resisting any drag, tilting and rolling through rough seas. However bigger us, Navy ships, like aircraft carriers, have V-shaped hulls that can cut right through a big wave, unlike smaller ships that are drastically affected by the wave's height. Also, US Navy aircraft carriers, to be specific, rely on other various techniques such as ballast systems that help them to maintain level. It simply works as the scale in the hand of Lady Justice. In other words, the crew can raise or lower the ship's center of gravity, controlling buoyancy and keeping it stable. Now we understood what are Mosenta waves and how they form, how do you survive them, but why scientists won't just predict them. Even though scientists are still debating the likely multiple causes of rogue waves, they are already trying to predict them. In the US, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, is working on an hourly forecast for potentially hazardous ocean conditions called Wave Watch 3. Other mathematicians argue for calculating and then charting the most efficient way rogues can form to factor in both the linear and non-linear theories. Trials of this approach in wave tanks have been fairly accurate, though lab conditions are never the real-world chaos sailors encounter. Whatever the algorithm, the trick is making predictions fast enough to be of use to ships. On the high seas, conditions can shift minute to minute, let alone hour to hour because it might be fairly easy to measure a car's speed and distance already traveled, but to predict exactly where that car will be in an hour's time, factoring in traffic lights, other cars, weather, and more, it would be tricky. Science pulls it off, to some extent, with weather forecasts, but the sea is even slippier to divine than the atmospheric rivers on high. To predict rogue waves, you need to know, in detail, the initial conditions of the sea, so you have to be scanning all the nearby waves somehow. The science of rogues is a lot better now than in my day, says Van Dyne. But a lot of it will still come down to good seafaring, and hoping, when you see it, you get the chance to grab the wheel. Like this video and comment below what is your thoughts about this crisis, Mysterious, Mysterious Minds. Minds.